<clears throat> well, hello everyone, and this is Quintus, back at it again. Uh, you may remember two weeks ago I recorded my reaction of Baldur's Root, Volume 13. Um, I said I might do Stelsas, but... I had to like take a couple of days to emotionally prepare after like what happened with Baldur's Root, so I ended up not recording it. But I love Stelsa. Stelsa's great. Stelsa is Tizius's mate's <clears throat> mate spirit. Um, but now we are going to do Volume Fourteen of Cleanliness and Clownliness, which features um, uh, Masty. Um, I've done like comics. Like a hive swap comic contest um, entry about Masty um, way back when it didn't win anything, but it was fun to do. It was about Masty skating on a wet floor or something. <clears throat> anyway, this is a dark world, both because it's night and because of the brutal struggle for survival among its polyhemochromatic inhabitants, many of whom seem to thrive on havoc and carnage. You'd be interested to see the Michelin Guide entry for Alternia. You're convinced that after a day here, Ayn, Ayn Rand would sign up with the Little Sisters of the Poor, Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun would join the Quakers and Adolf Hitler would seek membership in the World Peace Council. Whew, good Godwin's law alert. Feeling a little dramatic tonight. Um, ah, because... Also, who is this has a name. It's Caraco Piero, apparently. Uh, but we are doing Masty in this episode. So, oh, oh, she has a little smile. Oh, well, that's some good music. You guys can't hear it, but that's some cool music. Let me just. Uh... Despite a certain sense of pervading existential gloom that you haven't managed to shake, even after communing with a possible oracle slash secret agent, yay, Boulder, you're feeling pretty alright. No more brooding in your cliffside apartment. You have a fresh thirst this evening, a thirst for friendship. You're wandering around a neighbourhood you haven't seen in a while, just a few blocks from where you crash landed. Maybe you'll go pay a visit to the crash site of your ship, even though it's locked long since been stripped for parts by the local population. Or maybe you'll try and find Demon to say hi, though you're pretty sure he's still living the nomadic shrubbery lifestyle. You're just here for the nostalgia, honestly. Malays who? You hardly know her. Just then, from across the street, echo two voices raised in argument. Well, one is soft and murmuring, one is loud and honking. A rustbud girl and a purple blood guy are squared off in front of a patch of graffiti that blooms over the brick like moss. The girl appears to be in the process of scrubbing it away. There's a mop bucket and a collection of sponges next to her. And I told you, <laughs> this shit is sacred motherfucking iconography, the purple blood is saying. So fuck the hell off, little red dumpling. The rust blood says something back that makes him laugh. The sacred iconography appears to be a collection of swear words and a couple of colourful renderings of certain sections of troll anatomy you have not yet had the chance to explore. The girl with the bucket rings her sponge out and stares the clown down. Well, you assume she's staring him down. She's wearing big round goggles that match to match the bright rubber gloves pulled up all the way to her elbows. Despite the mop bucket, <coughs> she looks more like a scientist from a B-grade horror movie than a janitor. The purple blood doesn't have any visible weapons on him, but that doesn't make him look any less dangerous. And unless the girl has a blade in that mop handle, she's totally defenceless. You've faced this precise scenario more than once, but it doesn't get any easier. No matter how much self-confidence you earn or hardships you endure, life or death friendship decisions don't get any easier. Alright, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm probably not going to do like a voice for Masty, but I will for Kakaro, because um, right now I'm kind of tired, I've literally just woken up, so let's mind my own business. Listen, you aren't in the goddamn alien special forces, you aren't the friendship police, you can't afford to insert yourself into the middle of every single altercation in hopes that the drunken gamble of destiny will offer up new and greater connections onto your sore, tired ass. Not made of goodwill alone, everyone needs breaks, man. You march casually by, hands behind your back. If you know how to whistle, you would. Nothing to see here, folks. 
Feet smack the ground behind you and the girl runs by, surprisingly spry in the rubber boots. Not spry enough, apparently, because the high blood is hot on her heels. Nope, not helping. Definitely not. Don't get involved. Don't get involved. You already made your choice. You are not getting involved. At the last moment, you stick out one of your famous legs and the clown goes flying. He hits the pavement hard nose first. Son of a bitch. <laughs> he went and got involved. The high blood might be kissing concrete, but he won't be for very long. It's tough to kill a clown. You take this opportunity to GTFO. Damn, you don't know anybody around it. Maybe you can run back to your stolen vehicle before... Anne's grabbed you by... God, by not helping. I must have... Yeah... Hands grab you by the back of the hoodie, hauling you around the corner into the shadows of an alleyway. Shit, the clown must have friends, and those friends must have circled around behind you. You open your mouth to scream, not because not because you think anyone is going to help you, but just because you might as well. If you're going out fighting, you might as well go out making as much noise and being in the, as obnoxious as possible. A rubble gloved hand slaps over your mouth before you get out more than a squeak. You taste soap. Chill. Stop struggling. It's the Rust Blood girl. She's taken the time you'd bought her and cashed it in to take refuge in an alleyway. The two of the old stills the purple blood stomps by, stomping and cursing and bleeding from a gash across his forehead. Ah, <laughs> you did that. Your leg did that. You'll never get over the rush you received from doing something cool and competent. Marcy, um holds on to you until the sound of his footsteps fade. You feel a heartbeat hammering against your back. Ooh. <laughs> she lets you go and slides away to the other side of the alley, as if in apology for being so close to you before. Oh, don't apologise. <laughs> Her boots squeak. <laughs> what, like in Spongebob? You take a few steps nearer so you don't have to shout to be heard. You thank her for helping. You are always just all about helping, apparently. It's like not to mention the part where you tried very hard not to get involved. Yeah, you didn't have to do that. Actually, you shouldn't have. I'm perfectly capable of tripping my own clowns. You tell her you have no doubt that's true. Even if she doesn't have a sword and a mop handle, she seems to have a good pair of legs. <laughs> Mentioning a mop appears to remind her that she left all the cleaning equipment out on the street. She takes a furtive glance back down the way the guy had gone, and then heads back towards the graffiti. He scampered to keep up. You shouldn't be out alone in a place like this. Not that I can really summon much gumption to care me on this one walk down the street. But did you come here to die? Because that's what's going to happen if you keep this shit up. What's your deal? You don't know about your deal. You've worked really hard to not consider your deal at all. Because the existential radio static that prickles at the base of your neck when you think about your deal, it is un astoundingly unpleasant. Attempting to change the subject, you ask her if maybe she shouldn't get out of here while she has the chance. Is that bucket really that important to her? Marcy looks at you with a certain eyebrow raise that you're well accustomed to, to by now. Oh shit, you just put your foot in it again, culture-wise. Oh, hey, oh, she's got a good face. You know, that you know that DreamWorks eyebrow. <clears throat> you wish you could find a book with a crash course on Alternia, or at least a decent Wikipedia article. But it's not like there's any helpful earth guide for idiots. At least you've never heard of one. Besides, things are different depending where you are on earth geographically. You imagine it's the same for Alternia. You feel positively nauseated at the idea of having to learn a whole new set of societal norms. You'll just stay in this particular city, thank you very much. Do I care about my bucket? <laughs> That's kind of a weird way to phrase it. I care about it as much as the next person who doesn't want to get cold. Also, scoured drays don't grow on coniferous fauna. She tosses the discarded sponges back into the bucket. You bend down to help, but she stops you with a sardonic glance. Most of her glances are sardonic, but this one especially so. She goes back to work on the graffiti. If you're going to hang around, you could make yourself less useless. Watch and make sure that eye blood doesn't come back. Oh yeah, for sure. You can totally do that. Of course, you won't <coughs> be able to actually do anything if he comes back. Where's Ramalay when you need her? Maybe you could use your own limp corpse to slow the clown down. Not that you know Masty well enough yet to love the idea of sacrificing yourself for her. Man, character development is great. Not immediately going to your death is great. <laughs> that thought sends a creeping wash of anxiety along your spine. You don't understand it, so you try to distract yourself. You ask Marsty if she just cleans graffiti or if she has other jobs. Okay, well, maybe not jobs. You know, nobody on the tourney has an actual job. 
whatever I'm feeling mostly. Today I was feeling get, um, getting rid of this incredibly ugly piece of shit drawing. Tomorrow I might be feeling dirty front doormats. Depends on my mood. Yeah, you def get that. You're also a person of mercurial moods. <laughs> Do you seek out new friends tonight or go to one of your standby pals? Sometimes the universe just sweeps in and decides for you. Yeah, well, you're extremely weird and focused on weird shit. She is. She has no chill. <laughs> but also kind of magnetic at the same time. Oh, it's freaking me out. Wow, thank you. Master dunks her sponge back in her bucket. Or scour Dre, right, buckets are dirty. The drones don't make it down here very often. So there's a lot of shit to scrub. It's her if it's cool that she likes cleaning so much. Uh, way off from physical labour is considered morally virtuous, but also kind of looked down on? Fuck, maybe you could use an earth cultural handbook your own damn self. Who said anything about liking it? Who made the rule that I can only do what I like? She slams the sponge down hard in the scour dray, getting water down the front of her apron. This is just what I do. What, do you like wandering around in someone else's hoodie? Accosting strangers? She's got no chill! <laughs> kind of, sometimes. You didn't choose the friend life, the friend life chose you. But Marcy isn't a stranger in a strange world like you are. She's got horns and grey skin and everything. You realise she's a rusty, but come on. Oh yeah. How many burgundies do you know exactly? Well... One, and he is interested in uh, meat, is pretty enthusiastic about it. One might say, over-enthusiastic. You think I'm not enthusiastic? She just hard to show you how enthusiastic she can be. A delicate calligraphy-based rendering of the word globe gobbler <laughs> disappears beneath her Sophie hands. Globe gobbler, I love that. Okay, maybe Demon is not the greatest example of someone enjoying their hobbies in a healthy and natural way, but you know plenty of other lowbloods with cool hobbies. Skylar, Chixie, Sarava. Am I supposed to know who those idiots are? Not all lowbloods know each other. Oh man, that's not what you meant at all. I'm not going to explain my life story to some random alien. She has no chill at all. You're in the help or not? Oh, well, you thought you were supposed to be keeping an eye out for clowns. Yeah, well, instead you're asking me invasive questions. So now help me scrub. Despite these mixed signals, you pick up a sponge and start cleaning. This is actually a lot harder work than it looks like, and your back and shoulders begin to ache immediately. If Marcy does this every day, she must be ripped under that jacket. <laughs> she stops talking and you just clean alongside her, worried that you're royally screwing this up. You don't know how to fix it. A graffiti is quickly disappearing between your combined efforts. You're not sure how much longer she's going to put up with you after that. Ugh. <clears throat> Ugh. You've got to pull out the big friendship guns and fast. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> I've just woken up. I've got all kinds of gunk in my throat or whatever. You ask in your uh, characteristically smooth style what she's doing after this. Any plans? Just hypothetically? <laughs> Who knows? Probably I'll just look for more shit to clean. Hmm, well, it just so happens you know a lot of dirty places just exceptionally filthy. Oh, yeah. Where... Uh, try Uptown, I guess. Just so happens you have connections, Uptown girls and boys. You ask Marsty how she'd like to clean a mansion. Oh no, please. If we go to Zebra's mansion, I will fucking die. I guess that could be cool. Please let it be Gallic. Like, don't let it be fucking Zebra. What were you thinking? Well, first of all, you want to bring your new friend to your swank stolen car. Marcy doesn't seem that interested, although she does comment that she's never been in a scuttle buggy. And she begins picking up the crumbs from your back seat. You tell her she doesn't have to clean up after you. Bold of you to assume I'm doing it for you. <laughs> you shrug, you've come to accept that some of your friends are just fundamentally difficult to understand. Some days you really think you're beginning to get it, and the next you remember that alien isn't just your immigration status. Hmm. <laughs> Marcy stares out the window as the houses get bigger and grander. The car passes beneath an archway and a light sweeps over the two of you. Marcy stiffens. You tell her not to worry, it's just a sensor to discern your blood colour. <laughs> Mullet gave you a plug in to scramble it, no stress. Must be out nice to have friends in high places. You ask Marcy where she lives. Wherever I feel like. Oh, does she not have a hive? She can get cold. Depends. 
Uh, so she's just like demon. Her hive was destroyed, or possibly up a tree like Baldir. <laughs> Although it's possible she was just fucking with you. I wish you'd stop comparing me to people, like I should know what you're talking about. And no, my hive is fine. It just gets boring cleaning the same fucking building over and over again. You get how... <clears throat> you get how that could be cool, going from place to place, like Demon goes looking for meat, and Coneal and Asdeja look for people to kill. Everyone here seems to be weirdly obsessive and hyper-fixated. <laughs> Maybe that's what happens when you bring up a bunch of kids in a robot-regulated world where the only rule is don't get cold, and by the way, some of you are inherently inferior. Have fun! As you get closer to Z- Oh, no, 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 no! No, no. You begin to get chilly strut pods. What if he tries to make Marcy into one of his uh, guests? He has that weird thing for low bloods. You figure she'll be safe if she's with you, but you aren't always the best at making good decisions with more than one friend to deal with at once. Oh god, the sight of zebras loses. God, I'm the worst character ever. I am literally driving her to get made into a slave zebra. Well, so it was clinched it. You can't take another condescending stare from zebra, Dad. Where are we going? I hope we won't talk about this pathetic mess on the sea. Barely worth my time. You could make a better mess, you swear. Ugh, no. I don't want a staged mess. Fuck, okay, who do you know who is kind of a slob but also not a total piece of shit? Elwood? Oh, Gallic! Goat Dad lets you in with a hysterically happy bleat. Oh, she miss missed you too, Goat Dad. Marcy weathers his snuffling and nuzzles. When he tries to eat one of her rubber gloves, she scratches him behind the ears as a distraction. She gently removes the glove from his mouth. Oh, I need these actually. He caught a Gallic, but it doesn't respond. Maybe he's out. There was red text on the bottom. I wondered it was it. The coffee pot is half full, but it's cold. Goat Dad bleats and puts you gently. Oh, poor guy, are you lonely? Has Gallic been neglecting you now that he has a hate boyfriend? <laughs> Marcy's a little more uncomfortable here than she had been in the car, but when she catches sight of Gallic's study, all of that sl slows, sloughs off. I don't know what that means. It's even more of a mess than it had been last time you were here. And we've been trying to impress you with his intellectual clutter. Yeah, <laughs> Kalik's probably got, like, organised mess. You're probably going to fuck everything up. She gets down to work immediately, stacking books alphabetically and sorting papers into piles by the subject. You know Gallic is an A-type personality. He will probably go briefly ballistic at the knowledge someone had messed with his stuff. But Marcy's just so organised and thorough. You're sort of weird just standing here and watching her clean, so you gather up all the used dishes and bring them into the kitchen. If we happen upon Gallic and uh, Tagora making out, then I will fucking scream. When you've done without your figure, you'll just try to be entertaining. You ask her if she's seen any movies recently. Since you've made friends with Zebedee and started hanging out with Tagiri's anime club, you've been exposed to multiple cultural touchstones. Yeah, I don't really watch much TV. Don't worry, I don't need to be entertained. She kneels down to start dusting me the couch. I know you think I'm basic, and that's fine. I don't really give a shit what anyone thinks. I am a condescending alien with no blood colour to speak of. <coughs> Yikes. So if you wouldn't mind. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Uh, oh no. Crunch, crunch, crunch. What the hell is that noise? And there you go again, getting swept up in a friendship with Denver and totally beefing it. You forgot about Goat Dad's propensity for nomming on anything within reach, and he spent the last ten minutes happily munching on several leather-bound notebooks. Galactic experimental word rumpuses. Fuck, he loves those, he's going to murder you. To smooth another layer into this fast, the front door creaks open and Galactic's voice rings out. Calling to Goat Dad, who lets out an excited bleat and scampers off, trailing little white scraps. Marcy looked down from you from the front of the house and down at the paper trail. Then she's out the window and down the hill because that ba um, her basic she may be, she's no idiot. <laughs> There was like red text at the bottom of Galek's thing. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Bloody hell. Well, let's go downtown then. <laughs> Try downtown. You suggest that this place look, uh, sure looks right for some serious plower cleaning because, wow, filthy. Yeah, I guess. I was planning on cleaning down here anyway. The drones mostly take care of the high blood neighbourhoods. Interesting. Zebra had Lobo's cleaning for him. Maybe he's an exception. I'm not here to explain cultural dynamics to you. At least not for free. You consider mentioning that you were the main character, and thus totally deserving of cultural exposition, but you doubt it should take that well. 
Also, it's kind of a weird thing to say, so never mind that. Show Masti and Ali recognised the one with the incinerate. <coughs> with the incinerator where Polypo had gotten rid of her assassination disguise. Here, maybe. Too easy. Okay, well, what about this stretch of road where Remelay killed a dude? There's still quite a bit of purple blood spattered around. Pretty good, but no. I don't have the right outfit for blood. Jesus, picky. Oh, sorry. Are my personal preference is inconveniencing you. No, but you aren't used to this shit taking so long to pop off. Usually you've made a friend at this point, or you've been killed. You've been killed before? What, are you a per-beast? Nine lives? In retrospect, that was also a pretty weird thing to say. You meant it as a metaphor. Sometimes your internal monologue gets out of hand and spills out into your interlocution. Whatever, dude. You're considering just bringing her back to your place to clean up the mess you've made there when you realise Marcy is no longer with you. You turn around to find her gazing down an adjacent street into an empty lot. Uh, the space gives you a brief twinge of recognition before it fizzles away to nothing. Eh, probably just deja vu. Oh, this is where Baldir died! <laughs> At first you don't notice the person sitting on the tire pile because without her other half, her silhouette is underwhelming. Follicle! Hey! Where's, where's, where's Follicle? Oh, fantastic. Uh, <coughs> oh, fantastic. Hey, Normie. Oh, hi, Follicle. It's been a while. She might notice that you're a whole lot less normal than you used to be. They're right, they're weird as hell. Hey, you also like um you are also like eighty percent more confident than you used to be. You don't back down from insults. Perhaps Marcy is the one who is weird because she's the one who is so fucking into cleaning up after people. That's really strange. Hey, that's a little judgy. Yeah, for real. Ha ah! Oh uh, you'd have expected Follicle to join you in mocking Marcy. You <laughs> didn't want to be too mean or anything. You're just really sick of having your intelligence insulted concerning stuff you absolutely could have no way of knowing about. What to make her look like an arsehole, but it usually seems to be in fact you who are the arsehole. Marcy seems to agree. Hey, maybe go fuck yourself a little bit. You apologize, you didn't mean it, you just you just experienced pilot confusion when there's too many friends in one place. You're sorry. You didn't mean to insult her hobby, but she actually doesn't really seem too into it. You are just trying to help. You know plenty of low bloods who do all sorts of activities. Oh yeah? Who? Well, Follicle for instance, she trolls, wait. You know whether she and her boyfriend uh, harass people, and they seem to enjoy that. Also, this Skylar and Chixie and Sarada, they all excel in their fields to a certain extent. God, <clears throat> right. So how's that going for them? Well, you deflate somewhat. Chixie gets skeeved all the time, and Skylar constantly has to defend her home and loses against thieves. Sarada literally has to gouge out their own eye and downplay their psychic power. Vicari, well. Here you can tell, Vakari is having a great time falling off cliffs and imagining the firmament above. Might be an outlier and therefore shouldn't be counted. While you're- Oh my god! While you're working through your apparent classism from navel-gazing monologue, Massey's checking Follicle out, like really checking her out! Oh my god, are we gonna get red Follicle and Massey here? Who the fuck are you? Follicle slaps Massey's hand away. Keep your fronds to yourself. Masty raises her goggles up to her forehead. You've got void rot! No shit, troll Sherlock. Masty gives another one server. She looks impressed. You honestly can't blame her. If Masty likes grimy things, well, follicle is right up her alley. Dirt El Dorado. Selfishly, you wish you'd met Masty back when you were more of a wreck at the beginning of your adventure. You're filthy. You have no idea what you're talking about. Are they black flirting? Oh. Also, fuck you. Massey touches her on the forehead, slowly this time so as not to take her by surprise. Follicle resembles a nervous little bug, trying to decide whether or not to school away. Are we getting shit fodder here? Do you think that dirt helped keep you <coughs> insulated? It's actually the opposite of that. If you were less grimy, the energy transfer would be easier. Alright, Cuprum isn't here, that means her giant battery isn't here either. Yeah, I sent him out for takeout. I needed a break. But won't she, you know, die? Not instantly. Does your hust top die as soon as you unplug it? What are you, a fucking void rot scholar? What do you know? I know a lot of things. Ask Marcy if she's interested in medicine. Maybe she should go into that. Marcy rounds on you in stark irritation. This is the most emotion she's shown since you met her. Whatever you're trying to do here, stop. I'm not stupid. What do you think they'd say if I applied to be a medic off planet? They'd laugh their asses off and hand me a saturated scrub pole. That's if they're feeling generous. Wow, Marcy just does not want to be a friend. <clears throat> this is what I do, so let me do it. 
chastened and uncharacteristically speechless. You know, to let Masty turn back to follicle. You really don't. Um, you don't really don't want to just leave it at that. But maybe the truly friendly thing here would be less trying to improve your friend's life and just letting them live it. Demon had told you much the same thing all those months ago. That he's planning to just keep his head down and try and stay alive. It's not uplifting, but not everything has to be. Master gives Falkal some advice as to the best way to make sure her body retains as much energy as possible. Falkal grounds, and you're pretty sure if she had eyes, she'd be rolling them. You do notice, however, that she listens. Master sa um, starts back down the sidewalk after that, pushing her scoured dray in front of her. After a moment's hesitation, you follow, half expecting for her to get mad again. It says she just slows down so you can catch up. She's pulled her goggles back down over her eyes. You think they're probably mo um, more there for social reasons than protective ones. Sheepishly, you apologise for being a busybody back there. You're just really used to wanting to help people out. Kind of for selfish reasons, friendship reasons, but still. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. No hard feelings. You just like fixing things when they're busted, or um, <clears throat> when you've busted them through your own chronic idiocy. Sometimes you just got to do what you can, but you think Masty might understand that a little bit. Yeah, I think I might. Sometimes it'd be like that. I don't really feel as if we made friends with her, to be honest. Just that she tolerates us. Well, let's get the instant veil. <clears throat> What's a uh, high top thing without an instant veil? Uh, intervene. You'll get killed immediately. <laughs> intervene. Who are you kidding? You were never going to leave it to fend for itself. It's against your religion. Your religion of reflexively and ceaselessly searching for new bodies. Uh, you won't make excuses for it anymore. You've decided to take what Baldur said to heart and just resign yourself to your fate. Well, that isn't exactly what she said, but a lot of it was confusing and spooky. You're half convinced she was just doing it for the mysterious aesthetic. You stride confidently towards the altercation, calling out a challenge to the rogue clown. Nobody messes with those less fortunate while you are on the case. And since it's been resoundingly too long since you had a truly ironic and hilariously and hilarious twist of fate before you, as soon as you step up to the side, what the purple blood's fist connects with your head, and your head connects with the concrete. <laughs> Clock. <laughs> God, that was great. I kind of feel like we didn't really make friends with Masty, just, yeah, that route was, it was all right, apparently, uh, Sky and Heretic wrote that one, uh, yeah, it was not my favourite, but, like, certainly not my least favourite, <clears throat> Zebra, uh, but that was all right. It was alright, so yeah, I'll do I'll do uh Kakaro in a in a bit once I'm once I've got this bloody gunk out of my throat. Uh I'll see you in a in a bit.